The everyday functions of the cell are performed by organelles, such as the mitochondria, ribosomes, and chloroplasts. Plant leaves have thousands of cells, and the insides of each cell are in constant motion. Energy fuels this motion. All living organisms must have energy. Without a constant supply, the organism will quickly die. Energy is the ability to do work. Everything that you do requires energy. Breathing, thinking, running, and even growing. Most energy use can be seen in the form of motion. However, many uses of energy are at the cellular level and are not so easy to observe. Like the growth of a tree, energy for living organisms on Earth comes from the sun. But no organisms can use the sun's energy directly. Light energy must be captured and stored in order for plants and animals to use it to live. In the same way, solar panels capture the sun's light and convert it to electricity. The chloroplasts in plants are the organelles which capture and store light energy for us to use. They capture the energy and store it in what we call food. When you see food, you should think of it as stored energy. Chloroplasts are small sacs of the green pigment called chlorophyll, arranged in layers to collect sunlight. Chlorophyll gives plants the ability to carry out the chemical reaction called photosynthesis. In photosynthesis, plants combine carbon dioxide from the air with water to produce food and oxygen. The word equation for this reaction is carbon dioxide plus water yields food plus oxygen. The shorthand that chemists use is CO2 plus H2O yields C6H12O6 plus O2. You may recognize the chemical formulas for carbon dioxide, water, and oxygen. But C6H12O6 may be new to you. It is the formula for a molecule called glucose. Many people say that plants make their own food in the photosynthesis reaction, when actually they make glucose. Plants link many glucose molecules together to form starches, like the starch stored in a potato. In fact, plants can make all three types of food, carbohydrates, fats or oils, and protein from the basic glucose molecule made in photosynthesis and small amounts of nutrients they get from the soil. Animals and all other organisms which can't perform photosynthesis must obtain their food by eating plants or by eating animals which have eaten plants. Not only do plants produce all the world's food, but they also produce the world's supply of oxygen. That's a pretty big job. So why do we need oxygen? Does this sound like a stupid question? We all know that without oxygen, we can't live. But what makes oxygen so important? Oxygen is necessary to get the energy we need to stay alive. Plants capture the sun's energy and store it in the glucose molecule and other foods as well. When you eat food, you receive packages of energy stored by plants. Your body must open these packages to obtain the energy you need. And that's where your cells come in. <laughs> The mitochondria in our cells is where this energy is released. Mitochondria take glucose from your digested food and combine it with oxygen from your lungs. This process is called cellular respiration. Cellular respiration is when a cell takes a simple sugar molecule like glucose and in the presence of oxygen turns that glucose molecule into ATP which is the energy molecule. And one of the byproducts of cellular respiration is carbon dioxide. In cellular respiration, we often say that food is burned to release energy. We can also think of it as the cell's way of releasing the packages of energy produced by the plant during photosynthesis. The word equation for cellular respiration is glucose plus oxygen yields carbon dioxide plus water plus energy. And the chemical formula is C6H12O6 plus O2 yields CO2 plus H2O plus energy. 
Knowing this equation answers some of the most basic questions about us. Why do we breathe oxygen? Mitochondria need oxygen in order to release energy from glucose. It seems strange to say that we breathe for our mitochondria, but it's true. Why do we exhale carbon dioxide? Well, because the body produces it as a waste gas in cellular respiration. Just as a car produces carbon monoxide when it burns gasoline, the waste gas must exit the body. Glucose is the preferred fuel for our cells, but if it is not available, we can also break down proteins and fats and burn them to release energy. There's a recommended percentage for carbohydrates, fats, and proteins in our diet. 60% of our calories should come from carbohydrates. The carbohydrates are used for energy and performing everyday activities. 30% or less should come from fats, and the fat is used to insulate and for regularity of bodily functions. Protein should consist of 10 to 20% of your calories, and the protein is used for muscle and tissue repair. Now you may have noticed that photosynthesis and respiration look very similar. Photosynthesis equals CO2 plus H2O yields C6H12O6 plus O2, and cellular respiration equals C6H12O6 plus O2 yields CO2 plus H2O plus energy. They appear to be the exact opposites of each other. Photosynthesis uses the waste products of cellular respiration. Photosynthesis also produces what's needed for respiration. In turn, respiration produces as waste what is needed for photosynthesis. Many people believe that only plants do photosynthesis and that only animals do respiration, and that plants do not need oxygen. Well, this is not the case. When plants store the sun's energy as glucose or other substances, none of it is available for the plant to use to stay alive. The plants must then use oxygen to break open the glucose to obtain the energy they need. That is cellular respiration. The fact that plant cells have mitochondria is evidence that cellular respiration does occur in plants. Mitochondria, which release all the energy in cells, are found in all eukaryotic cells. So while plant cells do have mitochondria, animal cells have far more. The reason for this is simple. Since animals move, they require more energy, and therefore their cells contain more mitochondria. Most life on this planet revolves around two tiny cell organelles, the mitochondria and the chloroplasts. The chloroplasts capture the sun's energy and store it, and the mitochondria gives the organism the ability to release and use that energy to remain alive and to perform all of life's functions. Proteins are large molecules made up of smaller units called amino acids. Now, you've probably seen amino acids for sale in a health food store or maybe your local pharmacy. There are 20 common amino acids which make up the protein of all living organisms. Proteins make up much of the structure of cells, especially animal cells. When you look at a person or another animal, what you see is protein. If all organisms are made of the same materials, then why don't we all look the same? Well, let's take a look at what happens when you eat a hamburger. Your digestive system breaks down the protein from the hamburger into amino acids, which are then carried to the cells by the bloodstream. Once inside the cells, they are transported to the ribosomes, where they are made into protein once more. Now, wait a minute. If you are made of amino acids from a cow, then why don't you look like a cow? Because your ribosomes put the amino acids together to form human proteins, not cow proteins. Human proteins and cow proteins are only different in the arrangement and total number of their amino acids. But remember, they are made of the same amino acids. How can this be true? How can organisms which look and act so differently be made of the same materials? To help you understand, we might consider the letters of the alphabet. All of the many words in the English language are created with only 26 letters. As with amino acids and proteins, 
the number and arrangement of these letters can produce a huge number of words. You probably understand this if you've ever played Scrabble. If we think of a protein you eat as a large word, like endoplasmic reticulum, digestion would break them apart into the individual letters, and they could be reassembled into many different words. Have you ever heard the phrase, you are what you eat? Well, it's actually quite true. You don't look like any of the foods you eat, like fish, raisins, or beans, because your ribosomes put the amino acids together to form human proteins. How could these tiny parts of your cells know how to assemble amino acids in the correct order to produce your unique human protein? To understand this, let's enter the nucleus and examine the DNA. DNA, or deoxyribonucleic acid, is the huge molecule which makes up our chromosomes. DNA is a long polymer. Uh, a polymer is made up of subunits of smaller molecules and it's these subunits that impart the information in a DNA molecule. There's actually four different subunits that can go into building a DNA molecule. The order of these four subunits is what uh, is the information that the cell reads. DNA is like a set of blueprints for a building. It contains all the information which the cell needs, including the information to make proteins for the cell. This is written on the DNA molecule in a four-letter code. These four letters, A, T, C, and G, represent the four base chemicals which form the rungs of the DNA molecule. A set of three letters specifies a particular amino acid to be used in building a protein. Plans for each of the thousands of proteins the cell produces are found on its DNA. The section of DNA that has the code or plans for a single protein is called a gene. A gene is a small portion of a DNA molecule uh, that, that has information for one specific function. Uh, for instance, a gene would, would have the instructions to tell you how to make an enzyme. Or a gene might tell you how to make a structural protein like collagen that's in our skin. Uh, that's a structural protein. When the cell starts to make a protein, the necessary gene is copied by a molecule called RNA, ribonucleic acid. This process is like making a photocopy of a set of blueprints. The RNA copy of the gene leaves the nucleus and goes out into the cell to a ribosome. The ribosome is able to read the instructions on the RNA and use them to put the amino acids together in the correct order and length to produce a human protein. The cell can select and use any of over 100,000 human genes to build different proteins. This knowledge of how protein is made in the cell has allowed scientists to do some amazing things. Scientists were able to isolate that particular DNA sequence which specifies insulin, which is a protein. They isolated that gene and genetically engineered that gene so that bacterial cells could recognize that DNA information and use that DNA information to produce the insulin. Sometimes people have mistakes in their genes which cause them to produce faulty proteins or no protein at all. This can cause disease and deformity. Researchers have identified about 4,000 genetic disorders, including Down syndrome, hemophilia, sickle cell anemia, cystic fibrosis, and many others. The future of genetic engineering, I think, is in the correction or the treatment of human disease. That's one of the one of the big er that's one of the big areas for genetic engineering. Although Genetic engineering is also used in um, the, the process to make um, disease-resistant crops, the um, process of producing animals that uh, gain weight faster, chickens that lay more eggs, that kind of thing.
You and all other mammals started out life as a single fertilized egg, about the size of a period on a typed page. We call the fertilized egg a zygote. This cell contained a complete set of chromosomes to tell it how to grow and produce you. Your zygote got half of its chromosomes from your father and half of its chromosomes from your mother. How did the single cell grow into the trillions of cells that make up your body? Well, the cell had to reproduce itself over and over again until your body was formed. Cells reproduce by dividing into two parts, but it's not a simple matter of cutting the cell into two parts over and over again. What would happen to the chromosomes if cells just split in half when they reproduced? Well, the number of chromosomes would be cut in half. A fertilized human egg contains 46 chromosomes. The two new cells would have only 23, and a third cell division would reduce the number to 11 and 1 half. Now, this would never do. The cells would not have a complete set of plans to build all the necessary proteins to produce a new organism. Cells have developed a method to make sure that each new cell has a complete set of the necessary chromosomes. The process is called mitosis. Mitosis occurs in a series of steps or phases. The first phase is called interphase. During interphase, the chromosomes in the nucleus make copies of themselves. This gives the cell double the number of chromosomes that it had before. For example, the zygote, which contained 46 chromosomes, would now have 92. To demonstrate the process, let's look at an imaginary cell with only four chromosomes. After copying, it will have eight chromosomes. The copies of the chromosomes remain together joined at a single point called the centromere. In phase two, called prophase, the cytoskeleton of the cell rearranges itself to form the spindle. The spindle is a group of protein fibers which stretch from one pole of the cell to the other. Next, the nuclear membrane breaks up into fragments. During metaphase, the third phase, the spindle fibers attach to the centromeres of the pairs of chromosomes and pull them to the center of the cell. In the next phase, anaphase, the two identical chromosomes separate and are pulled to opposite poles of the cell. In the last phase of mitosis, telophase, the fragments of the nuclear membrane assemble to form new nuclear membranes. Mitosis, which only refers to the division of the nucleus, is now complete. Now the cell must divide into two new cells. This is done by fibers of the cytoskeleton forming a ring around the inside of the cell membrane and pulling the cell into two parts. Now two cells have been formed from one cell, and more importantly, they have the same chromosomes. Each of the new cells divided to produce a four cell mass. The process is repeated over and over until a new organism is formed. Through this same process, you started out as a single cell, a zygote, and grew into the individual that you are today. So the next time you're going to a ball game, shopping at the mall, or even studying your science, stop for a second and remember that everything you do is made possible by your cells. Now, these tiny guys are simultaneously performing the many functions required to keep you alive.